allow him to. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. I'm going to preach this morning on the solution to murder. The solution to murder. From Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. I'll read those verses, and then I'll lead us as we pray. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a call shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Reka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, You fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge binds you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you'll by no means get out of there till you have paid the very last penny. As we come to pray, I didn't realize it till this morning that uh, D. Hammock, they took him to the hospital yesterday, and they're doing surgery on him today. He's at Vanderbilt Hospital, and I'd like us to remember him especially as we pray. Our dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and our hearts are grateful to you for all that you've done for us. And like the missionary said, how can I hold back when you did, didn't hold back anything, Jesus? You gave it all. You sacrificed yourself so I could have a personal relationship with you. And I pray, Father, as I preach this message, that your Holy Spirit would just hover over every heart. I pray that hearts would be receptive to what your Spirit says, and they'd be obedient to you. And, Lord, we want to be faithful to lift up D. Hammock. We pray that his surgery would go well. We pray that he'd have a recovery, good recovery. We pray for Gene and his family as they're down there with him. We ask that your comforting presence would comfort them. Father, I pray that when it comes time of the invitation, that people would respond to you as you see fit. We pray these things in the powerful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I read about a professor by the name of Edward Keedy. He taught at the University of Law at the University of, he taught law at the University of Pennsylvania. Every year for his first year students, he would always begin the class this same way. He'd put the numbers four and a blank space and two. That would be on the blackboard. And he would ask the students, his what do you think about that? What does that mean? And sometimes a student would say, well, that means 4 plus 2 equals 6. And he'd say, no. Well, maybe it means 2 plus 4 equals 8. No. Uh, maybe that means two mi uh, 4 minus 2 equals 2. And he'd say, no. And he'd say, really, what that means is you don't know the solution until you know what the problem is. Until you know what the problem is, you can't diagnose what the solution should be. Ever since the beginning of the fall, ever since man fell, man's been looking for a solution to the problem of murder. How do we solve that problem? In this passage of Scripture, Jesus deals with the source. He deals with what causes murder. He goes to the heart and intents of a person's heart, you know. In these verses, he interprets the law in light of what he wants it to do. The religious leaders judge people on the external keeping of the law. As long as you did certain things and you didn't do certain other things, you're okay. But Jesus corrects that. He goes to the very heart of the matter. Notice with me, if you would, first of all, the authoritative announcement that Jesus makes. He says, you have heard it said, but I say unto you by his own authority the prophets would always begin their messages with thus saith the Lord they had no authority on their own the message that they brought was the message that God laid on their hearts thus saith the Lord and the scribes would always begin their teaching with a scribe has said or the law says they would never take any authority on their own but I want you to notice Jesus on his own authority I say unto you it's as if Jesus is saying, you've heard about the externals. Let me tell you what really the problem is. 
I want to deal with the matters of the heart, you know. He got to the very source. You see, it's easy to measure yourself by your standards. And that's exactly what the religious leaders did. They measured themselves by their standards. You keep this law, you keep this law, you keep this law, and you are somebody special. You're somebody that's uh, right with God if you keep these outward laws. I read about a, a young boy. He came to his mother and said, Mama, I'm six foot tall. And she says, what makes you say that? He said, I measured myself by my shoe, and I was six shoes tall. And she said, well, your shoes aren't a foot. He said, they have to be. My foot's in them. <laughs> He's measuring himself by his standards. Folks, it's not our standards. It's God's standards, you know. It's hard for us to realize how the Jews felt about the law. To them, the law was holy and divine. The first thing they did when they came to the synagogue, they would take the scrolls down, the law, and they would look at it with reverence, and they would show it around to all the people in the congregation. But their reverence was only external. They kept externally the law, but their hearts remained the same. Folks, you can be a rule keeper. You can try to be good, and your heart be as cold as a stone. You can be orthodox and be just as dead as a wedge. You know, I read about a mother who was out working in her flower garden, and her little six-year-old boy had a flower bub. And he's trying to, she's working in her garden, and he's, he's got it in his hands, and he's trying to open it up, and he's trying to make a flower come out, and it just makes a big mess. And he says, Mama, how does God do it? How does it make a beautiful flower come out of this bub here? And then he answered his own question. Oh, I know, God works on the inside. That's exactly right. God works on your inside, not the outside. Jesus dealt with the attitude that leads to murder. He said, you've heard it said, if you murder somebody, you go before the civil court. But then he says, if you're angry with your brother without a cause. What do you think he means when he said, if you're angry with your brother without a cause? Now, some people think anger is a sin. Anger is not a sin. Ephesians 4, 26 says, Be ye angry and sin not. Now, I want to hasten to say, it's very easy when you get angry to sin. Be ye angry and sin not. There's some things that ought to make us angry. The pornography industry that makes billions off exploiting women and the filth that they spew out, it ought to make us angry. We ought to be angry at the thousands of fentanyl pills that's coming across our border, killing over 300 people every day. We ought to be angry about that. I'm sure you've heard about MAD, M-A-D-D, -D, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. We ought to be mad at what alcohol does to people. Do you realize that more people have been killed by alcohol than all the wars we've ever fought to date? Alcohol has killed more people than all the wars. In a typical day, in a typical day in our country, 38% of the fatalities in our land are alcohol-related. We ought to be angry about that. Every 23 minutes, there's an alcohol mishap that kills somebody. Alcohol is involved in 90% of the child abuse cases in America. Drinking drivers kill 22 times more people than are killed in plane crashes and 15 times more than people are killed by guns. Now, you think about that. Alcohol kills 15 times more people than is killed by guns, and all you hear in our country is take away our guns. We ought to be angry at that. We ought to be angry at the effects of alcohol and drug abuse. We ought to be angry at the homosexual agenda in our country. Trying to say it, it's something that you inherit, something that's natural. It is not natural. And their agenda is to get it made a, a minority so it's protected by federal law. We ought to be angry about that. Amen. We ought to be angry at the 4,500 abortions that happen every single day in our country. We ought to be angry about that. But now let me say this. We ought not let our anger drive us to make unchristian acts. As much as I'm opposed to abortion, I'm just as opposed to bombing abortion clinics. Amen. That's not godly. That's not Christian. And as angry as I am about that, we ought to treat women who've had the unfortunate experience of abortion, we ought to let them know we love them and that Jesus loves them and that we care for them. If, if we hadn't acted in such an ugly way toward that, 
Christians could be at the backside of an abortion clinic. When those women come out, we could put our arms around them and say, I'm sorry this happened to you, and I love you, and I want to minister to you. That's what love does, folks. That's what love does. How did Jesus treat sinners? He treated them with love and compassion. And even though we ought to be angry at the evil effects of sin, we ought to love sinners. We have to love them enough where we have compassion on them and we show them that we love them and we put our arms around them. You know, there's healing power in a hug. And I'm a hugger. I like to be hugged. You know that. I've been here about five years. You know I like to be hugged. My wife's a hugger. She likes to be hugged. We hug often. If you haven't hugged your wife today, shame on you. I'm serious. Shame on you. If you haven't hugged, you ought to hug her right now. I don't get no takers. <laughs> There's healing power in a hug. When was the last time you hugged somebody who'd fallen into sin? When was the last time a brother or sister had sinned and you went to them and you put your arm around them and you hugged them and said, I'm, I'm here for you. I love you. And I'm praying for you. And I'm sorry this happened to you. And a power healing hug for a sinner that's fallen into sin. Jesus is giving a warning here about uncontrolled anger. Ephesians 4, 26, that unquoted that be angry and sin not. It's not a sin to be angry. And then it says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. Folks, sometimes brothers or sisters in Christ can make you angry. Sometimes your spouse can make you angry. Sometimes your siblings can make you angry. What do you do when a sister or brother in Christ has angered you and hurt you? How do you handle that anger? Let me give you a four-step plan to handle anger. And the first one is this. Confront your anger immediately. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Don't let it linger. You ever went to bed mad? Of course you have. Did you sleep? No, you didn't. You toss and you turn. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. And verse 27 in Ephesians tells us why. Neither give place to the devil. When you let your anger linger and you don't deal with it immediately, it begins to give the devil a place. And when he gets a toehold on your life, he'll take over. If you open the door just to crack, he'll kick it open. And he'll camp out in your heart. And that anger will settle into a, a grudge. Now, there's two words used for anger. There's a word called thumos. And the word thumos draws a picture of anger that just quickly blazes up. You know people like that? Their anger's just quick. My mama was like that. Boy, she could get mad just like that. And there's people like that. It just blazes up quick and almost takes control of them. That's the word thumos, but it dies down just as quickly. That's the kind of anger that James and John had in Luke chapter 9. They wanted to go into the city of Samaria, and the Samaritans wouldn't let Jesus in. And James and John say, Lord, let's call fire down from heaven and destroy these people. They were angry. Jesus said, your sons of thunder. Some of you are sons of thunder. You know. He said, you don't know what kind of men you are. I didn't come to destroy. I come to save. We need to remember that sometimes when we get angry at lost people. You get angry at a lost person and say things and drive them away. Sometimes we say things in anger that we can't take back. Then there's the word orge for anger, and that means a long-lived anger. That's the word he uses here. It's the anger that holds a grudge. It's an anger that seeks revenge. It's an anger that just will not die down. It's an anger that says, you hurt me, and I'm going to hurt you back. You hurt me, and I'm going to hurt you twice as bad. That's the kind of anger Jesus is talking about, that grudge that you hold. It just takes over your life in a root of bitterness. The first thing you do is confront your anger immediately. Deal with it immediately. The second thing, communicate in love. Ephesians 4.14 says, speaking the truth in love. Now, you can speak the truth, and there'll be no love in it. Speaking the truth in love. Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. I've had friends rebuke me in love that did more than the 
pat on the back from other people. A friend will love you enough to tell you when you're wrong. A true friend will come to you when you've hurt his feelings and say, listen, you hurt me and we need to deal with that. A true friend will let you know what's going on in his life. Matthew 18, 15, Jesus said, If your brother offends you, go to your brother and tell him alone. And if he hears you, you've gained a brother. That's what we're supposed to do. And the third thing is confess your bitterness to God. If you've got bitterness in your heart and a grudge in your heart because somebody hurt you, you need to confess that to God. That's sin. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, Let not bitterness, wrath, or anger, or clamor, or evil speaking, let it be put away from you. And then lastly, commit yourself to being like Christ. Commit yourself to being like Jesus. Ephesians 4.32, and be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted. Folks, it's so easy in our world today to be hard-hearted. Be kind to one another. Love is kind. Christ-likeness is tender-heartedness. Christ-likeness forgives people. It says, remember how Christ forgave you. You'll never forgive someone for any greater hurt than Jesus had to forgive you. Commit yourself. I'm going to act like Christ in every situation. And then secondly, notice the actions that lead to murder. Jesus gives an admonition here. And he talks about the three stages of murder. And the first one is the spirit of anger in verse 22. Anger. You have murder in your heart. It's the kind of anger I already mentioned. It's the word orge. It means I'm going to hurt you worse than you hurt me. It's a settled grudge. And folks, you need to realize that comes naturally with people. That's a natural response. But folks, sometimes a natural response can get you hurt. A pastor by the name of James Carter tells about a, a little fox terrier. You know, a fox terrier is a small dog. And his name was Pumpkin. And he said, any time a cat come in their yard, pumpkin acted like a dog acts. He began, burr, 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 burr. And he'd run the cat out of his yard, and then he'd trot back like he'd done something great. But he said, one, and he said, that's just kind of natural with a dog. He said, one day a great big tomcat came in their yard. And pumpkin acted natural. He began to bark and chase that cat, and it began to run. And then it turned around and attacked his little fox terrier. Laid him open with one swipe of his paw, like to clawed him to death. Acting natural got him hurt. Folks, acting natural can get you hurt. And by the way, folks, even if you get even with somebody, there's no satisfaction in that. Is there satisfaction in getting revenge on somebody else? There's no satisfaction in that. There's no joy in that. If in your heart, if you wish somebody would be hurt or damaged or you wish God would do something bad to them, there's no satisfaction in that. There's only grief in that. What happens when somebody hurts us? We think that they owe us something. And we think we have the right to extract revenge on them. The Bible says in Romans 12, 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You and I don't have the right to punish anybody. Now, you think about that. He said, vengeance is mine. It's not yours. He said, I will repay. It's not your job to make somebody else pay for hurting you. And yet, naturally, we feel like that. When somebody has hurt us, we feel like we have the right to hurt them back. Or we have the right to punish. That right is God's right and God's alone. For you see, really, they've wronged God. Not you. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 40, Jesus said, If you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. When somebody wrongs you or somebody hurts you, really they've done it to Christ because you belong to Christ. Let me give you a good example of that. 2 Samuel chapters 11 and 12 records the awful, terrible sin of David. He saw Bathsheba taking a bath. Very beautiful woman. He desired her. He sent word, who is this woman? And his servant said, David, she's married. She's Uriah's wife. Give him a warning. And David didn't heed the warning. And he went in and he, he slept with her. And the result of that, a child was conceived. And trying to hide that, he had Uriah killed. 
And he thought he was home free until God sent Nathan the prophet to him. And Nathan told him a little parable about a wealthy man who had many sheep and a poor man who had only one dear little lamb. And the wealthy man had company. And instead of killing one of his sheep, he took the little only lamb that poor man had and he killed it. And David said, the man who done that will die. And Nathan said, you're that man, David. And David repented. And I want you to notice what David said. He said, I have sinned against the Lord. In Psalm 51, he said, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Talking about God. What about Uriah? He had Uriah killed. God, he said, I sinned against God. My sin's against you. When you hurt someone else, you wrong someone else, you're really doing it to God because that person's made in the image of God. And David said, against thee and thee only have I sinned, God. The first step is that anger. The second word is insulting words. He says the word reka. And we really almost can't translate that word. It's really a tone of contempt. It's really saying, you know, you're a worthless, brainless guy. You know. it, it, it describes an attitude of criticism, a critical attitude. Where does that come from? Catherine Marshall, who's the wife of Peter Marshall, tells about she was reading in Romans chapter 14. Romans 14, 13 in the Living Bible. And it said, don't criticize others anymore. Don't criticize each other anymore. And she said when she read that, the Lord just kind of convicted her about that, about, you know, I'm kind of negative and critical of other people. And she tried to push it out of her mind, like, you know, everybody does that, or it's not wrong to be kind of analytical and kind of see about what people do. And the Spirit just kept nudging her about that. She said, okay, Lord, I'm going to try an experiment. For one day, I'm not going to make critical comments about someone else. And she made that commitment. And she said the first part of the day, she was pretty quiet. Not that she made a vow to be quiet, but she didn't have anything positive to say, so she didn't say anything. And as the afternoon wore on, she kept thinking, what's going to come of this? And the afternoon wore on, and other people saying things, and she wasn't negative, and she wasn't critical. And she said toward the end of the day, because she had not been negative and critical, creative thoughts began to come to her mind that she hadn't had before. She wrote a letter to someone in college. She began to pray for someone else. She began to mend fences with someone, all because she said, I'm not going to be negative and critical for one day. Folks, a negative, critical spirit is not from God. It's so easy to look at things critically and negatively. Maybe some of us need to try that experiment. She said what became an experiment for one day became a lifelong habit. And then the third stage is an attitude where it says, you don't have any moral value. He said, if you call your brother a fool, and really you're talking about his moral character, a fool casts dispersions on a person's character. It's an attitude that says the world would be better off without you. We don't need you. That's the kind of attitude that led Hitler to kill the Jews in Germany. We're better off without you. You don't deserve to live. And by the way, cyberbullying is just like that, folks. People get on the internet, say ugly things about other people. You might have heard on the news several months back, a girl got on there and over 39 times she told this boy, you're worthless, you ought to commit suicide. The world don't need you. And he did. He did. That's the kind of attitude here. The world is better off without you. This fosters violence and bloodshed. It comes from a person's heart comes from a person's heart you know God doesn't look at people like that the world may look at people as worthless but God never looks at anybody like that if you're marred by sin you're still valuable to God nobody is worthless you are made in the image of God even if that's been marred and you've been broken by sin you're valuable to God he died for you on the cross. He doesn't see anybody as worthless. A young man was in an isolated place and he's walking along and there's a bridge 
and he hears something, and he stops, and he listens. There's whimpering going on in the weeds. And he begins to investigate, and there's a little puppy about two months old, just whimpering. He's got a big gash on its head, and his paws are tied together with a cord, and it's laying there whimpering. Somebody had cast it out to die. So he began to make his way toward that puppy, and the closer he got, the puppy started to snarl and growl. And so he just kind of stopped and was patient. And he just waited by it, and he kind of inched his way closer and closer, and finally he got to petting the puppy. And he took the cords off its paws that had it bound and carried the puppy home and began to feed it, give it a warm place to stay. But every time he'd get close to that puppy, he'd growl and snarl. But he was patient. Just lovingly took care of the puppy, and one day as he was feeding the puppy and he went to pet it, began to wag its tail. See, love won out. That puppy had been mistreated. Somebody thought it was worthless, wasn't worth living, abused it, cast it out, but this young man felt this puppy is valuable. You may be like that puppy. The world has cast you out and counted you as worthless, but you are valuable to God. Isn't it amazing that sometimes when God reaches his hand out to sinners who are broken, they snarl and snap at God? But God's patient, and God's loving, and he keeps reaching out that nail-scarred hand. He keeps reaching out until one day we respond to him. Notice the effects of anger. It alienates. It alienates you from God and from your fellow man. It alienates 1 John 4, 20, if a man says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For how that if you love not your brother whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you've not seen? If you love God, you love what God loves, and God loves sinners, folks. We ought not be surprised when sinners act like sinners. That's what sinners do. We're all sinners saved by grace if you know Jesus, but we're still sinners. As they are now, so once was I. We ought to remember where we came from. And sometimes we kind of put ourselves on a pedestal and we look down on other people. But we need to realize God loves them just as much as he loves us. Now, I may shock some of you, but I'm going to tell you something. God loves the people outside the church who've never been inside the church just as much as he loves you. He loves the people outside the church just as much as he loves you. And we ought to realize that. And we ought to love them like Jesus loved them. It's amazing to me how people can come to church and hear sermons after sermons after sermons and then forget who they are and not really live for God. That's amazing to me. Sort of like an art enthusiast I read about. He had a painting of the Leaning Tower of Pizza. You know, it kind of leans. And it's right behind his desk. And every morning he'd come to his office and the picture would be hanging crooked. He'd straighten it back up and it'd be leaning again. So finally he asked his housekeeper, said, hey, do you move this picture? She said, yes. Every night I move it because when I don't, he said, it's crooked. I hang it so it, the tower hangs straight. That's what some people do. They twist the scriptures where they hang straight. The scripture hits us where we live, folks. You can't twist it to meet your lifestyle. Lastly, I want you to notice the application of the law here. He uses two illustrations. You see, without personal application, a message is useless. Unless you apply the message to your life, it doesn't help you any. And he gives two personal illustrations here. A pastor, after he finished his sermon one day, as he was walking out to church, he noticed the Bible sitting on the pew. And the cover was all worn and tattered, and he thought, I wonder whose Bible that is. It's some poor saint who's been bringing this Bible to church, and they wore it out, and he picked the Bible up, and to his surprise, the pages were stiff and new. Hadn't been read. They'd carried it to church. They'd wore it out just carrying it, not reading it. The Scripture was not given for your information. It's given for your transformation. He gives two applications here. The first one is a church application. A person's coming to worship. So if you come to worship and there you remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift there. Go make it right with your brother. You see, you can't worship if there's a grudge in your heart. 
You can't really commune with God if there's a grudge in your heart. You know, sometimes you can be sitting in church and God just begin to speak to you. Might be through a song. Might be through a word. Good friend of mine, Bobby Milton, pastor of a church in Idaho, come to church one day and a man was sitting on the back row just crying his eyes out. Nobody in the church but him. Church hadn't started yet. And Bobby said, sir, are you all right? He said, I guess I'm just under conviction. As he stepped inside the church, he just got under conviction. As you come to church, as you come to worship, and you realize there's something wrong in my life, there's a brother that has something against me, or I've got something against my brother or my sister, he said, you can't even worship until you go make it right. And then you come back to worship. I believe if our churches literally practiced that on Sunday morning, they'd be empty. But they'd be full Sunday night when people come back. Leonardo da Vinci was painting his great masterpiece, The Last Supper, and he got to the place where he was painting the face of Jesus. And somebody did something that kind of irritated him. He got mad, and he lashed out at the man and kind of said some harsh, hurtful things to the man, and the man went out. He went back to try to paint the face of Jesus, and he couldn't. Every time he tried to paint the face of Jesus, he, he couldn't. All he could think of was the anger and the ugly words he said. And finally, he had to put his brush down. He went and looked that brother up that he was harsh with, and he apologized. Asked that brother to forgive him, and then he could come back and paint the face of Jesus. He couldn't paint the face of Jesus with anger in his heart. You can't worship with anger in your heart. And the second is a courtroom scene. He draws a courtroom scene. He wants the people to know, hey, there's a higher judge than you. There's a, a judge who judges the intents of your heart. He knows, your, he knows the thoughts, and there's a higher judge. And both of these applications deal with urgency. Urgency. Deal with the problem. It's urgent. Folks, we're living in urgent times. You listen to the news, the Lord could wind things up pretty quick. You see Russia buddy buddy with China. You see the things happening around the world. It's like God setting the stage for the last roundup, folks. And that sells urgency. I wouldn't want to go meet Jesus with unresolved anger in my heart. I wouldn't want Jesus to call me home and stand before him with me having a grudge in my heart against a Christian who's done something to me or me done something I didn't get right. When Jesus comes, I want him to find me with a clean heart and clean hands. I wouldn't want to meet him any other way. Oscar Wilde wrote a story called The Picture of Dorian Gray. You're probably familiar with that story. It's about a man named Dorian Gray who always wanted to be forever young. And he got his wish. But even though he never aged, never got any gray hair, never got any wrinkles, his portrait that hung in his living room began to take on the ugly inner self of Dorian Gray. And he would look at that picture, and he'd look in the mirror and see how young he looked, and then he'd see that portrait of himself, and, oh, it's just so ugly, so he couldn't look at it, so he put it up in the attic. Covered it up, put it in the attic, so he didn't have to look at it. One day while he was up in the attic looking for something else, he bumped into that picture and the cover fell off and he saw himself as he really was. Evil, malignant, ugly, because that's what he really was on the inside. Folks, sometimes we have a self-image of ourself until the Holy Spirit convicts us and we realize that we're a sinner. You can think, I'm a pretty good person. I'm not as bad as old so-and-so. And God brings us face to face with who we really are. And we realize that we need a Savior. We realize that we can't atone for our sins. We realize that only Jesus can save us. Maybe that's where you are this morning. God's shown you a picture of who you are. God's shown you a picture of your heart. You see, there's a lot of people who look impeccable on the outside. You see them and you think they're wonderful people, but inside they're dead. And Jesus knows their heart. And maybe God's shown you a picture of yourself. 
you realize that you need to repent. As we give the invitation just in a moment, the invitation is a time when you respond to God's word as he speaks to you. Maybe he's speaking to you to come and make a public profession of your faith. Maybe he's speaking to you about making a, a change in your membership. Maybe he's speaking to you about something in your life. The prayer rails are open. You come pray. You won't pray by yourself. Let me ask you to stand while I pray. And when we have the invitation, as God speaks to your heart, we invite you to come. Lord Jesus, you know the intents of our heart. You know us. You know all about us, and you love us anyway. That always humbles me to think that you know all about me, warts and all, and you love me still. Father, I pray that as we come to this time of invitation, if you spoke to people about their lives, that they'd respond to you. I pray for people to respond and proclaim their faith in you and follow you in believers' baptism. I pray for those here that have things in their heart that they need to get right, that they'd get them right today. We'll give you all the credit and the glory and the praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Page 290. Page 290. You've been watching the worship services of the Allens Baptist Church. If the Lord's touched your heart and you'd like to have a personal relationship with Jesus, let me ask you to bow your head right now and pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I understand that I'm a sinner. And as a sinner, I cannot save myself. Right now, by faith, I turn from myself and from my sin, and I turn to you. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, we'd like to send you some follow-up material. You can call the church office. You can email us. You can write us at our church address. We'd be happy to send you some follow-up material. If you'd like to know more about the Islands Baptist Church and our ministries, please contact us. We'd be happy to send you any information that would help you. Thank you, and God bless you.